was your job title while working on Silent Hill 2 and Silent Hill 3? And what were your responsibilities on those projects? Well, first of all, I didn't have a job title because I wasn't an employee of Konami. I was just hired to do different things. And so, yeah, primarily I was hired uh, because they don't speak English. So I was hired to take it from Japanese into English. And that includes really everything that you can think of, uh, the scripts, the menus, even prior to the creation of the game, the consultation with the team about what sort of themes would work in the West, which would be too offensive in the West, you know. Um, can we do an abortion thing? Can we do a dead baby thing? How would, you know, Americans feel about that, you know? Should we go more in the direction of Lost Highway? You know, that sort of discussion. Um, so I didn't have a job title, but it was understood that I would do this translation. I would do consulting. I would then do the directing. I would find talent. I would direct the talent in motion capture and I would direct the talent in the voiceover. So yeah, I had a lot of hats to wear. Um, and the division of labor for the direction was is something I'd like, I guess I'd like to make a little clearer because I've seen some quotes about the directors, the multiple directors and this sort of thing. And, and also the credit roles, the term director itself, uh, which is a direct, was a translation of the, the, the phrase, uh, kantoku director. You have to understand that director from the point of view of game production doesn't exactly mean what I mean when I say directing the, the acting. When it came to dealing with the actors, uh, I was the director. There wasn't any other directors. Now that's, there are some ways in which the Japanese director knew what kind of a motion he wanted from a visual point of view because these guys were painters and such. So they had shots in their minds lined up. So they would occasionally say, okay, I want him standing with his hand on his hip or something like that. But that's really the extent to which they were involved in the, the actual direction of the actors. So, yeah, that was, that was my responsibility. Can you tell us a bit about the hiring process for Silent Hill 2's voice acting work? I was working with uh, my friend, who I'm still working with these days, uh, Harry Inaba. And we were asked to uh, find actors, you know. And we were going to do it in Japan, which was already, and still, I have to say, a really ambitious thing to do. I don't think in the history of games you, you're going to be able to find a, another game where foreign actors were hired in Japan and such a good job was done. I don't think you'll, you, you'll ever find it, anyone. It hasn't been done. So anyway, we, we were asked to find you know, voice actors and motion capture actors. So you know, o bringing people in for an audition is, is easy enough because most of the people that wanted jobs as voice actors or narrators or most, most of these people at this time were just doing things like instructional English, you know, educational tapes or this kind of thing. Or they were models or, you know, they were doing short little boring things. But anyway, uh, we, we just called the voiceover agencies who knew all the names of all the foreign voice actors. These foreign voice actors had registered with different agencies all over Tokyo, so they weren't hard to find. And you simply call them up and you say, can you send some people for an audition? They call the actors and send them in. And over two or maybe three days, we auditioned probably 30 to 40 actors, men and women. The reason we didn't do more is because there aren't that many more at the time we were doing this. There was, uh, and I know this because later we were involved in auditioning people, finding people for auditions for Shenmue. And Shenmue had something like, you know, 150, 200, you know, different speaking roles. So we had to literally find every single person and their uncles. So I know that there were no more than 100 scraping very, very deep in the barrel voice actors in, in Tokyo that were foreigners. We got something like 30 or 40. We auditioned, you know, probably 10 a day, something like that. And so I know there weren't hundreds. There couldn't possibly have been. We gave them a script for their roles, you know, for, for depending on which role we thought they were going for. We'd give them a little little bit of a script, and they'd practice in the hallway. They came in to the room where um, Owako and Sato and uh, probably Tsubuyama and whoever else was, four, probably four team members, chain smoking behind a desk, <laughs> And I'm running these guys through their lines, probably playing the other part. 
And they're watching. They're watching the movements. I'm watching the movements. I'm trying to elicit performances from them to see what they can do so I can judge their ability to uh, listen to direction, change their performances, how well they can interpret the lines, how well they can read, and all these different ways I'm looking at it. And after the actors would perform their bit, they'd leave the room and we'd discuss for a couple of minutes, what would you think of that guy? Oh, oh, he's no good. He doesn't blah, blah, blah. Maybe, maybe. So that's how we, how we did it. Basically, the team didn't speak English, so they had no idea of pronunciation. They had very little idea of how the acting sounded, had zero idea of how well these guys could take direction. And so they had their own impressions, but they knew, they were smart enough to know that they weren't a good judge. So they'd say, you know, what do you think, Jeremy? What do you want to go with? I'd say who I thought, and generally they'd agree. And we went like that. There was another really important thing going on, which was that since we had to do the motion capture, there was a debate, there was a discussion beforehand about how are we going to find actors for the motion capture? What kind of people should we audition for that? Because generally you think motion capture, you're thinking about how people move, you know, how they express themselves through movement. So there was a discussion of should we hire separate people for the motion capture and the voice? And in fact, how, how are we going to coordinate these two things? So we put our heads together and we thought about it. And we decided that what we would do is when when we did the motion capture, we would mic the room. Okay, there's a, there's a big studio that's used for motion capture. It was done at a place called Omnibus Japan. All this special equipment. It was quite early in the in the motion capture days. Big big studio. We decided we'd mic it and have video cameras all over the place. When the actors did their lines we would then be able to take the video and some audio of them doing their lines. Of course, we couldn't use the audio for production because it was in a huge studio and the, the, the quality was no good. But we thought we could do it like the way an animation is done in that the actors later would be able to view their video of, them, of their own performances and sync it to that. Normally, when you do an anime, you have uh, the actors in the studio trying to match the, the lip flap of the animation. Well, in this case, we would have the same kind of thing. We'd have the, the, the video of them acting, you know, doing the lines, barely audible audio, and they could match it to that. Therefore, their performances in the studio would match the natural way that they were speaking when they were acting the, the, the scenes during the motion capture. So motion capture was done first. Then weeks later, we did the, uh, we did the voiceover to match it up to it. And I think it worked out really well. Did Team Silent really know what they were doing in terms of picking the voice actors? No, they, they, they really didn't. They, they, they had no ability to judge how an actor was in the audition, I have to say. They are great at a lot of things, but judging actors was not one of them. Um, they couldn't tell an Australian accent from an African accent. Do you think the voice acting performances in Silent Hill 2 were largely intentional or accidental? If I had to come out on one side and say, was it intentional or was it lucky circumstance... It was more lucky circumstance than not. However, the great performances were great performances. But the crappy performances that worked were generally crappy performances. I think, though, in the case of 2, there were some technical loading, audio loading issues that affected the cadence, not of the lines themselves, but the rhythm um, of the conversation. So the pauses between lines, in some cases got artificially lengthened due to technical issues between lines. So there is some of that stiffness entered into some conversations. Of course, you know, it's a case-by-case situation. In, in some lines, if a person sounds hesitant, it may be because he's acting hesitant or acting scared. But, uh, yeah, use your own judgment to, to, to figure out which ones were which. But the only intentionality behind, I think, what you and I are both referring to is that the the, the the people that were chosen for the roles, in my mind, matched what I wanted, you know, matched what I thought the team wanted. Of course, you know, it wasn't just me. After the person auditioned, I'd say to the team, wow, you know, this guy seems kind of, he looks kind of sad, doesn't he? He looks kind of depressed, doesn't he? He looks, you know, he kind of has a slumped over, kind of broken down feel about him, right? And they'd be like, yeah, I got that too. And like, well, isn't that kind of what James is? Isn't he kind of, you know, upset about his wife and feeling guilt? And they're like, yeah, that's true. 
so that's what he was that's the impression he gave so i'm like yeah totally you know the whole way he talks is that way and they'd be like well great that that works so yeah so to some extent there's intentionality in that guy was acting for example as 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 best as he can and interpreting as best as he can and he's got a range and he had his own mind about you know how the character should sound and and how to express that and he you know he did it and that is limited of course within his own natural vocal range i i chose him because of his vocal range and his natural tendencies and then he took over for, from there and did his acting so it was both it's a combination of both things and um his acting got him to point x and his natural voice got him to point y and the combination of the two convinced the fans to point z and you know it was this synergy between those different things but, but he was in retrospect i'd say he was a great great choice wouldn't you and and the fans totally seem to agree and the limitations of his acting and his voice and these things have to be accepted within the larger picture Ultimately, in the end, I think he was great, and I think David was great, and, and Monica was great, and Donna was great, and they, they were all great. And, and I totally agree with Guy and others that say that it was because they weren't slick, overproduced, perfectly pitched voice actors that lent the game its realism. But at the time, I was only half aware of, of that, probably. The other half was it was out of my control. I, there weren't any, quote-unquote, super professional Troy Bakers in Tokyo. Were Silent Hill 2's original voice actors professional voice actors? What about Silent Hill 3's voice actors? Some were and some weren't. You know, Donna, for example, she's so she's such a professional. First of all, she has her own company and, and talent agency um, and studio now. And Donna is the voice on the Shinkansen. So when you take a bullet train in Japan now and you hear, we will now be getting off in Tokyo, that is Angela. That is, yeah. Actually, it's it sounds more like Claudia, though. We will now be exiting in the eternal paradise, despoiled by mankind. So, so she's a she's a tremendous pro, and Monica was uh, was, was was certainly doing some professional work. Donna, uh, 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 Dave was uh, an NHK announcer. I think Clifford Ripple had done some uh, Ripple had had done some professional work, and then the others. I guess I would say no, certainly. Uh, Guy was not, although he had some acting experience in college. And um, Heather, fresh off the boat, she'd come to Japan because her boyfriend was like a business guy uh, doing stuff here in Japan. So she was looking for things to do. So a lot of people weren't, you know, and some of them were. Were you fully satisfied with the performances of Silent Hill 2's voice actors? What about Silent Hill 3? No, I don't think any, any director would ever be fully satisfied. I was satisfied. But if I had had unlimited time in the studio, I'm certain I would have gone over certain lines and said, let's do that again. But you don't have unlimited time. You, you, you have to time is money in the studio and you're only booked for a certain number of days. And so you have to make very, very quick decisions about whether something worked or didn't work. You know, you only have that opportunity right then, unless you mark the line later to try again. But mostly you don't do that. Mostly as a director, you have an idea in your in your mind of sort of an internal voice for how that line should sound or the range that that voice might sound. But the lines are coming very quick and the, and, and the recording's going on the whole time. So you just you just do what you can. You try to get on tape what you can get. So yeah, I was generally satisfied, but definitely not completely satisfied. I have a sense that I came out of three more satisfied than two, probably. Three was a little bit easier because the actual, the actual scenes were longer if I'm correct. And so there was more back and forth between characters. And um, as a narrative, it was a little bit, yeah, more, you know, hung together more as a narrative rather than these short little scenes. And actually, so in, in four was right back to these really short little things. It was kind of irritating to, to direct because there were such short little things. But three, we had some real, real nice lines and real drama. And I, I actually really loved everybody's performance in that. Was Donna Burke chosen to play the role of Angela Orozco because she sounded older? We didn't have any other choices. Donna was our very best choice. She's she's a good actress. She's a professional. She gets the stuff done. And um, we knew we could rely on her. We did not have other choices. If we had to go back, audition all those people again, 
we would do the same thing because we didn't have any other choices. It was certainly not an intentional decision. Donna has a range like anyone else that she can work with in. And she was already working very hard to not sound Australian. And Donna is a trooper. She'll, you know, she'll, she's a pro. She'll do whatever you ask her to do. And she can take direction like no one else. She can, you know, give you all these different versions of different things. But what she cannot do is sound like a 16 year old girl unless she wants to sound totally fake. So um, fundamentally, what people need to understand is doing a job of this kind of thing with the kind of foreigners hanging around Tokyo 12 years ago, whenever we did this thing was, you know, fundamentally a, a weird thing to do. And no one would, would recommend it. And we certainly didn't recommend it. It's what, the, it's what the team wanted. And so we did the best we could. And, you know, in case anyone wants to, I don't know, listen to what I said and kind of say that, well, he's not doing what Team Silent wanted or he's not expressing what it, let me just, let me just guarantee you that, believe me, not even on the radar. There's no way Team Silent had any intention for her to sound older or look older. And if anyone reads that into anything, they're, they're just wrong. Silent Hill 2 is well known for its weird or awkward voice acting. Was this an intentional choice or a happy accident that the actor's cadences and inflections often came out as peculiar? Was every strange thing regarding the vocal performances intentional? No. No, um, if something seems peculiar to the listeners, it probably was an accident. In some cases, it, it may not have been. It may have been the actors trying to show confusion or fear or hesitation or my trying to show that. It, it may have been. But if there's something that really stands out as, as weird or unnatural, it's probably not intentional. If I had to answer the question, uh, I'd say, no, certainly not everything was intentional. You, we have limited time in the studio and you try to do the best you can. And then there's other limitations like trying to match the performance um, lip flap or that, those sorts of technical issues. Do you know of anything that made it into Silent Hill 2 or 3 that wasn't originally supposed to be in there? Like any changes to the Japanese script or things of that nature? When I was just doing the translation, I worked very, 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 very closely with Mr. Owaku, who did the unusual thing of reading every single thing that I translated. Now, he couldn't speak English, but like most Japanese people, he could read it pretty damn well. So he would read what I translated, and if he ever had any questions about why I did something this way, uh, or similarly, if I ever had any problems with something that was in the Japanese script that I felt wasn't going to work in English, I would bring it to his attention. And in every case, we came to an agreement. Sometimes that agreement led to him changing the Japanese so that I could then uh, write the English the way I thought would work. And he would say, oh, yeah, yeah, good point. Sometimes I would say, oh, so that's what you meant? But in all cases, we, we came to an understanding with each other about what he was going for, and I got the, the, the best possible insight into you know, what was supposed to happen to the, to the player, how they were supposed to feel, how the character was, you know, their motivations. And so there was no point at all in Silent Hill 2, especially when I felt there was some ambiguity about what, what was supposed to be going on. So were there changes to the Japanese? Yes, in the process of creating the final product of which I was a part of the creation process. They were doing it with the foreign audience primarily in mind. Whose idea was it to reunite the cast of Silent Hill 2 for the signing away of voice rights during the recent HD collection voice acting debacle? I believe that I was the one that got everyone talking to each other. In fact, I, I know that I was the one that got the actors talking with Tom. I said to Monica one day while we were chatting on Facebook or something, I said, look, I, I'm talking with Tom right now because I'm doing Book of Memories with him. Why don't we just call him up? I've got his number. You know, and maybe we can get Guy on the line. And so if you're looking for someone that was working very hard to get the actors to talk to Tom so that we could hammer out something, I was, you know, I was I was in there and I haven't been trying to get a lot of credit for that. And some people have even you know, made me into the bad guy for some reason because of certain other actors. But uh, no, I was I was working very hard to get everyone involved. And as far as the actual phone call connecting the actors to Konami, U.S., that, that was me. 
because I was the only one that had Tom's number and was working with him. In Silent Hill 3 for the HD collection, did you approve the change from despoiled to unspoiled in Claudia's monologue? First of all, I approved it after, you know, I think it was after the fact. Tom said to me, you know, I kept, um, you know, all the dialogue. It was just a couple of things, changes I, you know, I had to make. And he said the I'll kill you bitch thing. And I said, oh, OK, whatever. No, no big deal. It's certainly not a big deal. And then the despoiled one, I was a little bit more like, oh, well, I think we interpreted the lines differently. I think he thought that I didn't know what the word despoiled meant. I think he thought that I thought that despoiled meant unspoiled. And so in his mind, he was correcting a mistake I had made. Whereas if you read the line a little bit differently, it kind of gets hard to explain. You know what I mean? Um, it's either a, a paradise that is has been despoiled by mankind or to create one that's unspoiled. So it's it's a different interpretation. And so it was just kind of a him thinking I had used the wrong word and then compounded by a slightly different interpretation, which is which is right. And then, you know, I went back and looked at the Japanese and I have to say, um, I probably should have translated it a little bit better. The Japanese actually says uh, here, I wrote this down. The Japanese says a paradise that was lost. Reclaim a paradise that was lost. Yeah. So anyway, the Japanese says uh, Ushina wareta. Tengoku or something like this. The whole problem would have been solved if I had just said the paradise that was lost rather than a paradise that was ruined or spoiled or despoiled or, you know. So in my mind, looking back on the whole thing, Tom did a fine job, you know, changing it to unspoiled. Doesn't make a difference anyway, the bottom line is. In Silent Hill 3 for the HD collection, did you approve Heather's line change from I'll get you for this to I'll kill you, you bitch? How do you feel about the use of cursing here? I think it doesn't change a damn thing. How do you feel about the fans' reactions toward line changes like the ones we previously mentioned? How do you feel about the fans getting angry with Tom for these line changes? I think that it's like a witch hunt, you know, trying to go after Tom for minutia that has absolutely no significance. You know, it's, it's, a, it's as if people have talk about a paradise despoiled by mankind. People think that Silent Hill, you know, as it was written in Japanese, is some kind of a paradise and any footprints on it you know, ruin the, the, the perfect paradise creation of the, the, the Japanese team who, you know, understood the entire nature of Valtiel and the, you know, Seal of Metatron and blah, 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 blah. And it's, it's just, um, it's just wrong. It's like a witch hunt for Tom. You know, oh, Tom changed the line. That must be representative of his ego. And the line was perfect before, you know, in fact, it would be more perfect if it was in Japanese because even translating it was already ruining the purity that was the, the Japanese. It's all just weird talking to yourself behavior on the part of certain fans, I think. Did you have any other influence on the HD collection, or were you uninvolved? I was uninvolved for the most part. I helped the uh, I helped them recreate the original font set by, <laughs> well, it's kind of too detailed to explain. They, they have this sort of font set that includes all these Japanese characters, and I needed to reproduce them on my own keyboard so that they would be able to match up fonts or some some weird thing like that. But no, I didn't have any. And I think we translated a couple of menu items that were new to the HD collection. But other than that, zip, zero, nothing. Indeed, I would surely have loved directing the new voice actors. If I had been asked, I would have jumped to it. But no, I didn't have anything to do with it. Are you familiar with how Japanese developers handled their source code for games they made during Silent Hill 2's production? I do know one thing that, that might shed some light on it. And that is that at the time, and I don't know what the practices are now, but it was standard practice then for a team to throw away their code. It was a security thing. Yeah, they threw away their code. They never reused it. And um, it was different from game to game. It was a standard practice, what, the, what, what all the teams, at least Konami, did then. And um, they were all doing it. So uh, the fact that code was thrown away is not surprising in any way. A super specific translation question about Silent Hill 3. Leonard is diagnosed as schizophrenic in a note found by Heather. Do you recall if the original Japanese called this disorder Shishinbu Respio, mind split disease, or Toko Shichijo, integration disorder? Do you think Team Silent meant for Leonard to have MPD or DID and mistook it for schizophrenia? Or do you think they definitely meant schizophrenia? Why does this even matter? Okay, so it never said in the Japanese that he has split personality disorder, or who the fuck cares? It was just a crazy voice on the phone. I never would have given it a second thought. And if someone had said to me, 
Oh, no, what? you know what, Jeremy? I want to do it like where I change my voice rapidly. I might say, hmm, that sounded kind of good. Okay, go with it. Because when you're in the booth, you know what matters sometimes more than your preconceived ideas of how it should sound? Sometimes what matters is the energy that a, and creative, creative ideas that the voice actor brings. Maybe the voice actor will say, oh, okay, I got a great idea. I really want to do this. Can I try it? And they'll tr you'll say, sure, try it. Let's say what it sounds like. And they'll do it. You say, whoa, that sounded crazy all right. Okay. In fact, you had more energy on that take than the last take, which was how I was sort of imagining it. So, okay, that's not that important. Let's go with what you did. That's like how it might go in the studio. And it's only afterwards that people pick through it and say, oh, wait a second. What psychological disorder is this? And where does it say in the script that he has, you know, schizophrenic break? That doesn't say it anywhere. Tom. We, we want to do a phone call here, right? What should we have the person say? And then we'd say, okay, well, how about, you know, we'll sing a song. That would be kind of weird. And I'd be, okay, yeah, I think I can, you know, have him sing it kind of in an off tune. That would sound good because I half remembered that from some movie or something like this. And that's it. That's how the creative process goes. Parenthetically, you know, the notes and the diaries and those kinds of things were, you know, sort of like the last priority because... They were considered by the team to be sort of like, you know, extra stuff that people probably wouldn't really pay that much attention to or read. And so, you know, if if I have 100 points of attention and I gave 85 of them to the, you know, the movie scenes and, you know, 14 to the menu items and stuff like that, I would have given, you know, half of 1% to the to the notes and stuff like that because we really didn't think that it was going to be poured over with this kind of attention. And, and in fact, they were so obscure even to me in terms of what they sort of meant or what was going on that it was a backstory stuff that I translated as dutifully as I could, but I didn't always understand exactly what its purpose was or ramifications or were. And as far as the birthday caller, I don't know if that's Leonard or not. I never thought it was Leonard. And in fact, the actor is a different actor than Leonard. It was a guy named Dennis Fault who did that um, birthday voice, along with the uh, voice of the um, the haunted house. How do you feel about the addition of the old Silent Hill 2 voices into the HD collection? This was a fan service that Tom was really trying to get done. You know, when you're in an organization like this, believe me, what, what Tom did, getting them in there, I consider nothing less than a almost a kind of a miracle of um, a Herculean effort that he must have gone through to get that done. And, you know, guy makes it sound like it's just nothing. Just drop them in there. Fuck that. You know, when you're in, a, in an organization like Konami and you have to make these rusty wheels move, even the faintest movement is a, is a tremendous a lot of effort. And I can only imagine how much Tom must have pushed to get that much done. The path of least resistance is what normally happens. And so anything extra just takes, you know, a thousand times more effort than it should to get anything moving. And, you know, Tom's in a, in a pretty low level position. If I was in Tom's position and they said, okay, we want to re-release Silent Hill. Do you want to keep the old voices or do you want to give it another whack? I, I would have given it another whack. Absolutely. Did Twin Perfect attempt to contact you at all for comment on their HD collection video? Have you seen this video? What do you think of it? Uh, no, they didn't attempt to contact me. Uh, yes, I did see it. And what did I think of it? Um, you know, I, I would need to refresh my memory uh, about it. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm sure I can't say that nothing that they said was true. And I'm sure I had problems, a lot of problems with particular things that they that they said. You know, in, in general, I think their their approach involves a, a lot of cherry picking and is, in a sense, trying to whip up controversy so that they can benefit the, their own uh, profile. I mean, it's hard to, you know, kind of. Avoid that conclusion. I, I I guess I would have to address you know the points you know point by point. Um, if 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 the first question was why did he mess with the perfect art that was Silent Hill two um, and three? Why did he you know hire new voice actors? I'd say it was a it was a, a totally understandable and well intentioned desire to improve a product that had flaws. And I, I'll be the first one to admit that I would do the same thing. If tomorrow I was in Tom's position and they said, all right, Jeremy, here's $100,000. You can hire professional actors in, 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 um, in L.A. and get another 
crack it at we can get improved sound you know quality we can uh, have more studio time more time to get exactly what you want i would have said yeah i'd love to but uh you know and and so now you could say well jeremy you were a member of team silent so you have every right to do it first of all i was not a member of team silent and don't say i i was but second of all i don't i don't think it matters especially if you're going to provide the old audio and the new audio as you as 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 tom said he was going to Something that was done 12 years ago with limited resources that turned into the big hit that it is now deserves to be treated, yes, of course, with a lot of respect, but that doesn't mean that you don't try to improve on it. There's just two different things going on, you know? Um, if, if you're a creator and you have the power of creation, power to improve something, if you're that kind of ambitious and confident person that should be given the role of game production, then that's what you do. That's that's what you do. And any any kind of analogy to oh it's like trying to repaint the Mona Lisa is 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 kind of it's kind of ridiculous. Um I wouldn't obliterate the old voices of SH2. I would have kept them and 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 offered a, another track, sure. That that would have been the the best solution. So, anyway, Tom, yeah, not the Antichrist. Nope. Tom, Tom, guy who works very hard. If he really wanted just to create uh, to get a paycheck, the fans wouldn't even know who he is. This is a guy who has spent a, an awful lot of his emotional work doing everything that he can for for the games that he's been involved in. Do you know anything about Japanese contracts for voice acting in the late '90s? Basically, when an agreement is made, you say, "Okay, let's get to work, and we'll sign contracts later." If you do sign them at all, everyone expects that since you have a relationship. You're not going to want to screw up the relationship by doing anything other than what you've agreed on. So, it was never an issue at the time. Almost certainly, contracts were viewed as things done between entities, you know,、uh, companies. So, Konami would sign some sort of a contract between、uh, an agency, maybe. In the case of Silent Hill 2, they were working with with me and、um, my partner at the time. And、uh, you know the money, like you know, funneled through us. You know, we got the money for auditions, and we paid off these people and paid off these people. And you know, nobody cared about contracts. We would say to the actors, "Okay, here's how much you're going to get, and we get your voices, right?" And they'd say, "Yeah, you know, okay, we got the voices." There was never any anything beyond that. There were, it was understood by all the actors that there were buyouts. Everything was a buyout. The agencies explained those things to them. We explained those things to them. We never felt like we. We're going to have any problems, and and then after it was done, of course, even less thought was given to it than before because we had made the game. So it kind of just you know slipped under the bridge.、Um, obviously, they wouldn't have done the jobs if they weren't happy with the money they got. And then once we had them doing the jobs, we really didn't think about it because Japanese people don't sue each other. So、um, in retrospect, it's pretty naive to think that foreigners aren't going to aren't going to be that way. It's a little na- naive, but yeah. So. In answer to your question, back when we were doing these these voices, we didn't have contracts between with the actors individually. We had contracts with the agencies、uh, and that sort of thing. And since the agencies had a relationship or a contract with the actors, it was assumed that it was all you know it was all good. And we had verbal understandings that they were all buyouts for the voices. Period. End of story. There was no complications such as. Well, it's for this iteration of the game, but not for future ones. There was nothing like that, so no one could have predicted that there would be any problems. And later, as you pointed out, when problems crept up in relationships between foreign companies and and Japanese companies or foreign individuals and Japanese companies, then they started to eventually get the idea. Yeah, they have to get more, you know, tightly written contracts, and in order to avoid any future legal issues. So that came later, but at the time, it just wasn't wasn't a thing. Their legal department didn't 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 push for contracts, and it just it just didn't come up. And and the the actors, I think as they've all, they've all said, no, they didn't sign contracts, but neither did they say, hey, where's the my contract? And so we didn't say it. And of course, we had agreements with each other; otherwise, the work would not have commenced. Do you know if Sato works as just Sato or a company he runs? Do you know if he has the source files for Silent Hill 2's cinematic scenes? I don't know what the hell Sato Works is, but、uh, 
Hell no. He would not only would he not have those files because it, it would have been like a massive, massive violation of every company directive to get rid of the code and for, you know, copyright issues and stuff like that. Not only would he not have them, but if he did have them, he certainly couldn't give them over. So, no. What the hell? I completely reject that on the grounds that it's absolutely absurd. I don't know, but I certainly did not think when we were working on Silent Hill 2 that Sato was outside Konami. So if you ask me, he was a Konami employee. Maybe he broke at some point that I don't know, but uh, he was a Konami employee, and I thought for, for, for three as well. I don't think he was like an outside consultant or outside company. I think he left at some point. In fact, I remember when he went from Konami to America, he was sent there. Yeah, that was it. There was a bunch of develop, uh, R&D guys that were sent to KOA, Konami of America, to work internally there because they were going to do some game production there. He was sent to California. At that point, he was still uh, a Konami employee, of course. Now, it's probably when he was there in California that he decided, fuck this, and abandon ship. But I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that on two and three, he was a Konami employee, just like everyone else. Is there anything else you'd like to share about the making of Silent Hill 2? I named all the characters. A lot of things were named after uh, place names near where I lived in Massachusetts. So Sunderland, Massachusetts, uh, Ashfield, Massachusetts, Braintree, Massachusetts. I chose Sunderland because I was imagining land being sundered. I think I might have gotten that from the Thomas Covenant books, this concept of a – maybe the phrase sunder came in up in that. So it stuck in my mind, sundered land, Sunderland. Ashfield was kind of – I chose because it was a place in Massachusetts and because of the coal, the discussion of the coal fires in Silent Hill. So I thought that might work. Braintree, I don't know why I named Richard Braintree Braintree, but it was a place in Massachusetts that I always thought had a weird name. Toluca Lake came from a Little Rascals episode, you know, where Alfalfa's out on Toluca Lake with, uh, with his girlfriend. Different things, you know. Why do you think Guy C. He hates you? Okay, so the reason Guy hates me, uh, let's see. So there was the Silent Hill, you know, the making, the, the Silent Hill sessions, right? And that all, you know, got done with. And I don't think there was anything in particular. I mean, I didn't, I don't think we liked each other. And certainly from my point of view, he, he kind of grossed me out because he, he was driving around. I remember he, he had a big, uh, what are those big tank-like cars that, uh, those big ridiculous like Hummers. He had a Hummer. He had like a, a big fucking like tricked out Hummer. Which in Japan looks even more ridiculous than, you know, he's like a millionaire. You know, he's like a really rich guy. And uh, so, yeah, so I, you know, and he, and he was always, you know, like making a point of talking about like, you know, how much money he's got and stuff like this. And so uh, a man of leisure, you know, it, it was ironic. And I've told the story before that he, he, you know, he got the job because he said to me um, that he was unemployed and looking for work. Can I audition, you know? You've probably heard the story, right? He was bringing in his daughter for an audition. So he like, you know, rubs elbows with the, you know, fashionable people. Anyway, um, so uh, that was the story of how he got the job. And, you know, we go through the sessions. It was okay. But I, I, you know, I, the whole time I felt like, you know, I'm working with someone who, you know, frankly, he's a, he's a terrible actor. You know, he, he's just, no, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't really have to tell that to anyone you know, who, who can perceive, you know, what good acting is. I mean, it's weird on one level, but it, on another level, it's not weird because you have to remember the reason that I recommended him for the role. I, I was going to say I gave him the job, but, you know, it wasn't really my authority to give him the job. But on the other hand, as the only person who understood English that was in the role of saying, let's go with him, they would have gone with whoever I said. So, you know. The only reason I gave it to him was because he matched the character that I had envisioned when I wrote it, which was a depressed, you know, affectless kind of guy. <laughs> but it was fine. We, you know, we, we got through the whole thing and um, there was, you know, there was no hard feelings uh, about that. Um, fast forward to many, many years later, you know, maybe, you know, 10, over 10 years later, I'm, I... I think the next interactions I had with him, I don't know if it, maybe before that I was vaguely aware that he uh, had been complaining about his, you know, face being blurred out in 
the making of videos, or whatever. but it's a background noise. I don't really care. Whatever. Mm -hmm. the, the next interactions I had with him was uh, when I moved back to Japan, probably in about 2010 or something like this. Um, I was living on this little island. And uh, I, uh, for the first time in my life, I had some money because I had sold my house, you know. So we were living in my wife's, you know, old family house, which was now empty because her parents died and, you know, paying no rent. But we're on this little island that's like depopulated, you know. I had all this time, you know, and finally I had some money and no, you know, um, from the sales of the house. And, and I, uh, I was looking, I was thinking then that I wanted to invest it, right? Which, you know, never happened. I don't, never had enough money to invest anyway and never, my wife is risk averse, so never happened. But anyway, I, I started speaking with Guy about this because I knew he was like a mill. He was the only, you know, person I knew who had money. Now this is, this is, you know, creep warning. Okay. So let me just get this out there. You guys, you know, prepare to be, you know, kind of creeped out by this. Ironically, this is probably closer to the character of James than he, you know. So anyway, uh, I'm asking him for, you know, um, investment advice, or I want to ask him for an investment advice, but he, um, I've never actually told this to anyone, so I'm not really sure how to explain it because it's, it's unusual human behavior. So rather than simply saying, oh, you know, Jeremy, here's what, you, you know, if you're a new investor, you know, you can do this. This is the way you can do this, uh, but you should be careful of this. You know, that's how like a normal person might engage in, you know, offering advice. Guy didn't do that. What Guy did was um, some kind of strange head game behavior where he wanted me to, quote unquote, prove to him that I was, um, to, to, to put a good slant on it, you could say he was trying to mentor me. But it was very creepy because he would like make little like hoops to jump through. Like he would say like, all right, I want you to, you know, um, study up on what this word means. And, you know, we'll speak again next week, you know, and I'll ask you, you know, what, you know, like that kind of thing, right? Shifting the power dynamic to one where I was uh, more and more begging him for little bits of crumbs, and he would maybe spread some crumbs for me. You know, he's like, come back to me the weekend, you know, if I like your progress, I'll, you know, I'll give you more, you know, that kind of thing. He wanted to, sh to give little a little glimpse into the the enigma that is Guy Chihi and the secret of becoming rich because it's not that easy, Jeremy, you know, and if you really want to follow the path, you'll have to, you know, he wanted to like make the mystery, like there's a mystery to it, you know? So this went on for, I don't know, several weeks probably, right? With me thinking, oh, this fucking guy, I'll just pretend, you know, and then maybe he'll give me the name of some stock or something like this, you know? And uh, this went on for a while. And I don't know if this then coincided with the, um, I don't know if I just kind of gave up on that or he gave up on it or, uh, or it coincided with the, the remaking, the remake thing. But at some point, you know, the, uh, Tom Hewlett, you know, contacted me and then there was this, you know, book of memories. Tom, Tom first contacted me. I first became aware of him because he was, uh, redoing, um, Sparkster. I, I think I was reaching, you know, I was reaching out to companies, you know, generally for work in, anyway, you know, I, it wasn't like the old days for me when I had direct clients anymore, you know, because, you know, I used to have Sony and EA and Konami as direct clients, but now it was like translation agencies and stuff like this. And so I, you know, I somehow I started talking with Tom and he, he's like, yeah, man, you know, I, I worship you, you know, Rocket Knight and blah, 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 you know. So Tom was a good guy. And then Book of Memories happened and, you know, we kind of arranged multilingual translations for him and stuff like this. and recording sessions and then um i think it was after that that the the remaking thing came up tom or whoever said to me yeah there's this problem and um it looks like uh well it came out quite quite you know quite early that it was guy um and so my hatred of guy really began then because it was nothing more complicated than the fact that i wanted this game that i was so proud of and 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 more than any other game in in 25 game you know years of Game translation, this was something that I was so close to because I was virtually part of the development team. And the process of translating it was done so, so closely with, you know, Oaku. And and it turned into such a phenomenon. So it's just, you know, it's like my it's like my eldest child who I dearly love. And and here was Guy Chihi with a gun to its head. And so I hated him right away. At, at this point, he was already... You know, Facebook was, you know, I was on Facebook and I would see his 
you know, burgeoning fan, fan community, flattering little, you know, 12 year old kids, whatever. A guy talked to me, you know, and so he just, it just really irritated me, his whole thing. He buys an army jacket so he can look like James and people writing to him, you're the real James. And, you know, it's very unnerving because he's an adult and he's dealing with, you know, sort of children. At first I was just irritated because Guy was presenting it as if, um, you know, Konami was the bad guy and he's putting out these lies about, you know, residuals and stuff like this. And so it just started to like, you know, build up in me more and more, you know, like resentment because he's, he's telling untruths for one thing. I mean, here he is the guy who is the obstacle to this happening and he's putting himself out there to the fans as if Konami is the evil entity that won't let them, you know, there was this point where he realized he had to switch it. Once he realized that he was going to, catch wrath from the fans for being an obstacle he then started to flip the script and just said like one day he just said okay you know i've decided that you know i'm gonna you know i've been fighting this whole time i've been fighting just so your the voices can get back in they wanted to you know and it was like weird because like people were like believing him like i knew it was a complete lie and meanwhile i mean i knew the inside story because i you know i don't know i guess i talked to tom or whatever and you know and they said you know this is the only problem and I also feel responsible because there's the uh, the contract thing. Like, what happened to the contracts, you know, Jeremy and Inaba, you know? And Guy also blamed me for, you know, or I don't know if he blamed me, you know, talking to people or blamed me personally. You know, Jeremy's company lost the contract or something, some kind of bullshit. They just he started throwing around. So it was just, it was flying fast and fast and furious. And, uh, so I start. I decided to start talking to the other actors because I, you know, I'm still in contact with um, Monica, and uh, and then I reached out to like Dennis Fault and stuff like this. They're like, fine, you know, use it, whatever. Monica's like, you know, it's fine. Donna, you know, Donna, who I'm, you know, pretty close with, she knew what was going on. Oh, also by the way, she, Donna was also very, very closely involved with. Um, <laughs> she worked for the company. Donna, you know, Donna now runs this Dag Music, right? But previously, she had worked for this company. Um, uh, God, I can't remember the name. That that arranged these rehearsals and auditions, and you know, t- it was like a talent, you know, agency kind of thing. She worked for them, uh, and the whole story gets very sordid because you know she left them. It was all kind of happening then around the time of Silent Hill too and stuff like this. So things are you know kind of haphazard and and weird. But um, so anyway, so Donna, anyway, the point is, is that she she knew all the insider stuff, too, about contracts and stuff like that. She also knew that, you know, Guy Chi, he was an asshole and a terrible actor. And, you know, and once all this sort of stuff started flying around, you know, I got a really funny um, quote somewhere from Donna where she like totally disses, disses his act. She's like, you know, there were some really great actors and then some really shit actors, too. And, and, well, and Guy said, like, Donna, are you sure you are you really sure you want to like write that here? Uh, so anyway, um, I'm arranging behind the scenes to get the actors to do this uh, sign, you know, to, to, to go ahead with it. And then Guy starts to, because of public pressure, sort of, he, he starts to, he realizes he can no longer be the guy, the bad guy. He, he knew he was, he was on the losing side. So he, he flipped the script. Um, and then uh, it was a matter of you know, getting everyone to sign, but, but guy was still being a dick behind the scenes, even though he was saying like, I'm going to do it. He was behind the scenes. He was still like kind of holding out for a very, very long time, you know? And, and then it started to get really petty with me. He would say stuff like, I'll sign it as long as, you know, Tom, as long as you agree not to ever work with Jeremy again or some, you know, like really petty shit like this was like that thing he wrote to Michael, like, you know, remove, you know, remove Jeremy's name from this thing. But he was doing that with, with other stuff too. Like uh, he, he tried to get Tom to like, you know, make sure that he didn't give thanks to me, like on the, on the, you know, on, on the, on the remake or so, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Really petty shit. And it all culminated on this really funny night, which I can't remember what, what sort of confluence of events were going on, but I was, I was real time chatting with, I think Monica in Hawaii Michael from that website, who was like my go between between guy and me, or, you know, it wasn't that I would say, Michael, tell guy this, it wasn't like this, but he would tell me what guy was saying to him. It was the whole thing was so weird because and and Monica was also, you know, she had to like convince guy that she was on guy's side. Everyone had to had to like pretend like they were 
Monica was like, okay, Jeremy, I'm going to have to, you know, make Guy think that I'm with him on this by like, you know, saying things about you, you know, to Guy that, you know, and it was like, it was all this like weird conspiratorial like shit. Yeah, it was all this weird double agent stuff just to, just to get Guy to like sign this thing. And I, I also had to, um, by the way, I also had to find um, Jackie. And not only Jackie, but also, what's her name? Uh, Heather, which I guess maybe because we didn't find her or we didn't find her in time, or that's why the, the uh, SH3 voices aren't in there. If Guy C. He didn't go after Konami, would the original Silent Hill 3 voices be in the HD collection? Oh, I'm certain they would, yeah. Yeah. It's a virtual guarantee. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, I, I can't say that I, you know, I know 100% because I'm not in the position of making that decision, but, um, it's always been the assumption, like I have said before, that um, voices are bought out. They're owned. And whether you you know, make a PS game into an Xbox game or whatever, there's no renegotiation. There's no looking back in the shoeboxes for contracts. There are no contracts. They own the – they've got the data. They can put it in. It's their data. Yeah, they would have used it. Um, and uh, furthermore, this whole business about Konami USA getting voices – that are then going to be used by um, a game that's developed in Japan. Well, that, it didn't really happen. I mean, up until that point, it's kind of weird behavior. I mean, like Konami USA might produce their own games, which as they did, you know, in which case they you know, might find some Eastern European company to make it and then they'll you know, handle it. But to take a game that's developed in Japan and then have the U S version, the U S uh, side do something. And then that's, given back to Japan. That didn't really happen. Japan made their own decisions about their own development. So, for example, I was hired, you know, to do uh, the voiceovers for 2, 3, and 4, you know, by Japan. I never, I never ever dealt with Konami USA. I, I, I didn't know anything about Konami USA. So the first thing, the first time I ever talked to them was, um, and, and this is even though my twin brother worked for Konami USA. They, they had no part in any decision making about anything except for how many units of you know game they might they might buy. Yeah, so it wasn't until I talked to Tom Hewlett for Book of Memories that they ever had any input into any kind of Silent Hill anything. So um, yeah, so a- a- anyway, the, the 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 short answer to the question is yeah, they would have definitely used those voices, and uh, no one in America would have been looking to 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 get new voices because they don't look for ways to spend money. The the real secret behind the voiceover thing is that um, in a way it was done in a very slap it together manner because um i mean they shouldn't have been done in japan in the first place it's just not something that you know should have should have happened you don't really record you know an english voiceover thing or a french voiceover thing in you know japan you know you go to france you know where there's french actors and for english you go to america where there's you know actors the originals should never have the originals the only reason we have such shitty acting in it is because it was done in Japan. No one ever, even back then, even 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 back then, when the the um, when the expectations for quality in in in, uh, in voice acting was was lower. Even back then, they didn't do Eng- an English version of a game in Japan. They would have it done in the U, you know, in L.A. or whatever. So the reason we have shitty acting is because R and D wanted it done. In Japan, so we were like, okay, yeah, we yeah, we can do it. Mm-hmm.